about the possibility of life existing outside our own world. We have never been closer to an answer than we are now. Last month, scientists discovered two solar systems in the process of creating new planets. The discovery increased the likelihood that planets similar to our own exist. As we enter into the next century, scientists have pinpointed the areas they plan to explore and the technology they need to do it. Joining me now for a consideration of the search for life in the universe in Washington, Ed Weiler, the director of NASA's Origins program. Here in New York, Michael Lemonick, senior writer for Time Magazine and the author of Other Worlds. Also here, Neil Tyson, the director of the Hayden Planetarium and professor of astrophysics at Princeton University. Welcome, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you, Ed, in Washington. Thank you for coming in. Let me just sort of talk about this notion of discovering uh, stars in the process of creating planets around them. How significant is that? What does it mean? And for all of us, um, you know, make the, the underline the, the uh, event. Okay, well, we, we are very interested in the question of there's li whether there's life on other planets. But in order to, uh, to guess that there is, you have to have other planets for the life to live on. We've already learned in the past couple of years that there are planets going around other stars. We've found a few of them. And, uh, and now we're excited to learn that we are seeing new planets in the process of formation. It tells us that there are planets almost certainly throughout the Milky Way galaxy. And with those planets, there's the possibility of life. So the idea is that there are more planets around than we thought, and therefore, and constantly being created. And so therefore, it increases by mathematical exactly. chances, exactly. the it gives, likelihood. It gives life a place to get a, a foothold. Yeah. What's, what, has to, what do we think has to exist for there to be life? on some other planet? Well, first, as I said, we have to have the planet right. uh, for it to exist. Uh, second thing, to, that planet be life, though. There are lots of planets out there. We don't think there's any life on moon. Right. It has to be a planet where there is water in liquid form, because water is the universal solvent. We're mostly water. Most of the life on Earth is mostly water. Uh, so there has to be liquid water, as far as we know. Can't be too cold for that. Can't be too hot for that. And there also has to be uh, a certain kind of chemistry. There has to be uh, complicated carbon compounds that can form up in many different ways and join up and reform and interact uh, to produce the uh, complex biochemistry that we have here on Earth. And so, Ed, what's the most likely place there to be life outside of our own planet? Well, I think uh, there was, there's a good chance that life could have existed, evolved on Mars in the very early stages of the Martian evolution, uh, say four billion years ago when Mars had an atmosphere, was a lot warmer, and we, we know for sure now that it had liquid water uh, on the surface of the planet. Uh, if life had evolved at that point, it would have had gone probably underground uh, once the atmosphere started to disappear and the water went underground with it. Uh, the other place in the solar system that we're concentrating a lot on at NASA on is uh, Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, uh, which is a moon that's covered with ice, a thick shield of ice. But because the planet is constantly pulled and shoved by Jupiter's gravity, we think the core is very hot, so that there might be a liquid water ocean, actually, below that ice cap. When we say life, what does that mean to you and the people at the Origins program? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, there are various forms of life. Uh, there's intelligent life, uh, creatures with brains uh, like humans. There's animal life like bears and monkeys. Uh, but the most common form of life on Earth is bacteria and virus, viruses. Uh, in fact, the uh, tentative fossils we found in the Mars rock were very, very primordial bacteria, basically. Uh, so, you know, we, ju just finding, just proving that bacteria even grew up on Mars or Europa or something like that would be a great step because it wasn't that long ago when life was thought of, any kind of life was thought of to be a quirk, that it just happened here on Earth and no place else. Is it fair to say that among you guys, <laughs> you astrophysicists and, and people who write about this and people who had programs, where would you put this notion of finding life or intelligent life on other planets in the priority of things that interest you guys? Well, I think it's important to consider that there's a lot out there in the universe that's scientifically interesting. Certain elements of what's scientifically interesting have tremendous public appeal. And if you sifted through what is not only scientifically interesting, but what has tremendous public appeal, the search for life has to rank at the top of that list. Uh, it's important to, to remember, however, that there's a very good chance that life we find anywhere else is not going to be intelligent. It, it's probably bacterial or some sort of simple life form. But that's good enough. That's an example of life somewhere other than Earth. And 
a single example of that will significantly broaden our sense of self and our sense of, 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 of the likelihood of there being life in many other places beyond Earth. The late Carl Sagan used to say to me, it would be arrogant for us to believe that we are the only intelligent life in the entire universe. It'd be pig-headed, yeah. There's no... <laughs> yeah, I just, again, the sheer numbers that are involved, not only how many stars in the galaxy and how many galaxies there are in the universe, yeah. and as it is now becoming apparent that planets may be common around stars, for us to think we're the only life, uh, there's, there's, no, there's no way to... to to justify that, given the sheer numerics of it. In addition, the chemistry of life, the carbon molecule, molecules, the, the carbon chemistry that drives life as we know it, would be common everywhere in the universe because carbon is everywhere, everywhere we look. So if we were made of bismuth or some unusual element, then we might have the right to assume that we're unusual. But we're made of the most common stuff in the universe. I'm going to come back to Mars for a second because I want to come back to your book and the search. Are we, before I talk about Mars, are we... Uh, today, exponentially better equipped to find some evidence of life because of the technology that visits us. Well, you know, I would say no, we're not, but we're on the verge of being. We are. We are not there yet, but we will well, be. Well, the thing is that in the past couple of years, we've made some tremendously exciting discoveries. The ones you alluded to. In fact, uh, NASA is going to be making an announcement tomorrow um, of the possible photographing of a planet going around another star. This is something they didn't even think they were going to be able to do for many more years, which is going to be a spectacular discovery. Wait, so we let's slow up then. They're going to announce this tomorrow. How momentous is this? Well, m my it's understanding is that it's going to be considered one of the greatest discoveries the Hubble telescope has ever has ever made. And it's photographs history. of a planet in the making? No, a planet full fledged, already born, a planet around another star. How significant is this, Ed? Well, it uh, certainly reminds me of the 1980s. Uh, those of us who worked on Hubble back then before it was launched used to go around giving popular level talks and would speculate on what science Hubble might enable. And I think we all ended our talks with the uh, hope or, or dream that maybe we could make a very difficult observation and, and get the first image, actual picture, even one pixel uh, of a planet around another star. Uh, it was very on the, on the hairy edge of being able to be done, but uh, tomorrow you might uh, see such a picture. But we'll, we'll actually see the picture tomorrow. Yes, one o'clock. Well, but the uh, <laughs> Eastern, time. Eastern time. But 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 the point I was going to make is that, as Ed says, we've we've pushing ourselves to the very limit. We've been able to make these incredible discoveries uh, that you've heard about. But uh, as as uh, head of the Origins program, Ed is really in charge of a whole series of new instruments that over the next decade or two. Is, is going to do what you said, exponentially increase our abilities. So what you see now is, is nothing compared to what's coming. I think that's very fair because, uh, you know, when I think, I've been working on Hubble for 20 years and it was a great career so far, but I'm starting to think about what might be more interesting in the future. And Dan Golden at NASA has uh, come up with a vision that uh, we really ought to be going after intelligent life, that is trying to find it. Okay, uh, just, just, I want you to slow down just a little bit for sure. me. Uh, so, in other words, you think the most exciting career you could have in your arena today would be going after life wherever else it might exist. Exactly. I think, I think the greatest legacy that astronomers of my uh, generation could leave civilization is providing the first evidence that life, uh, at least bacterial, but maybe even intelligent life, exists someplace else in the, in, in the universe. Uh, I, I like all other astronomy, but that one discovery would be well worth a career. And how far off is that discovery? I think, uh, well, first, as somebody already pointed out, we've got to find places for that life to live. Michael and, pointed that out several times. Right. <laughs> Michael, yeah, I just finished his book. He didn't think uh, I, it, Michael didn't think I got it the first time. <laughs> we, we've, got, <laughs> you, we, we've got to find the pale blue dots, as Carl Sagan used to uh, talk about them. That is Earth-like planets. The planets we're finding now, either indirectly or perhaps directly with Hubble, uh, are Jupiter-sized planets, and we don't think life could exist in a place like that. So the role of the Origins program is to build bigger and bigger telescopes that finally will be able to enable us to image an Earth-like planet, but most importantly, s analyze the atmosphere around the planet. Initially, okay. just looking for water and oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, would mean that, that would mean that maybe some form of life lives there. Eventually, we could build telescopes big enough to look for, f for evidence in the atmosphere of industrial pollution, if you can imagine <laughs> that. Uh, and then that would be uh, certainly a better indication of quote-unquote intelligent life. Okay, but are we talking about the next 10 years? 
We're talking uh, in terms of finding the pale blue dots and looking for the simple elements like oxygen, carbon dioxide. Uh, we're talking about launching that device uh, in 2007. I'm sorry, starting it in 2007 for a launch in 2011. All right, stay with me. Uh, Michael, in this other world, you say that the announcement that there was evidence of life found in a rock from Mars, right. a little bacteria from years and years and years and years and years and years ago, was as momentous as Pearl Harbor or the tragedy of the Kennedy assassination. It's that momentous a story. Well, certainly for people, for people who, uh, who care about astronomy and science, I'm not going to say it's the equivalent of, of Pearl Harbor because that affected the entire world. Yeah. Uh, but for somebody like me who cares about astronomy and about space and about, about this question of life on other worlds, yeah, I, I will never forget when I first heard that. Okay. Tell me why this is important. Well, the, the couple well, of things... Why do we care if there's uh, some bacteria somewhere else in some other planet in some other universe? You know what we need to know? It's not just, it's not just the contest of how many planets we can find. It's, it's deeper than that. Up until recently, we were the only example of a solar system. And so theories about the formation of planets had to, in their end, produce a solar system that looked like ours because that's, it was the only data point we had. By looking through the galaxy and finding other solar systems, you can then characterize the whole process of the formation of planets, the evolution of planets, and the long-term um, uh, uh, stability of planetary orbits. There's a whole new way to think about life now. Earlier, you'd thought of life as being only in planets that were not too close, not too far from the host star to get the liquid water that Michael Lemnick described a moment ago. But we now know on Europa, there are other ways you can pump energy into a system to melt the ice and give you a place where you can have life. And the better we understand other solar systems, the broader our search net can be to find the life that might be out there. And I would, I would answer it in a different way if I could. Uh, you know, hum, human beings really want to know where we belong in the universe, in a spiritual sense, of course, but also uh, in a physical sense. What, you know, what's our importance? And we used to think five, six hundred years ago, everything revolved around us, literally. And gradually we've been learning, well, the Earth really goes around the sun, and the sun is just kind of a, an average star. And... Uh, in, in a sense, the one unique quality we have been able to hold on to is that we are the only life we know of in the universe, the only intelligent life. And the discovery that there's other life out there and even other intelligent life will further, it might be depressing for some, but it will further give us an understanding of where we all fit in. It's rather ego-busting. Yes, it will. I mean, where, what, how do you define intelligent life? Uh, well, that's... that's um, that's a tough one. In fact, some people, uh, you, dolphins are intelligent, <laughs> up to a degree. Let me know when you see it. <laughs> but, uh, no, we, we figure we'll know it when we see it. <laughs> Ed, where do you, you said that you think not only bacteria, but probably, likely, maybe, uh, I'm not sure what you said, will find intelligent life. I mean, what, what are you talking about? Well, if you find, if you find water vapor and carbon dioxide and uh, oxygen in an atmosphere, that's a good indication that there's some form of life on there because the reason that we have this delicate ba balance on Earth of uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen is photosynthesis. That is, plants produce the oxygen. Uh, oxygen would all disappear if all the plants disappeared from the Earth's atmosphere. So have we proven that there's uh, intelligent life on that planet? Of course not. We, we may have proven that there's grass or there's weeds or trees, whatever. If you really go after intelligent life, you've got to wonder if there's an intelligent life form on that planet and it has cities and it manufactures things, you know, what might you look for signatures in the atmospheric spectrum, so to speak? Uh, you're, you're talking about maybe CFCs, for instance, chlorofluorocarbons, mm. uh, those kinds of things. And there's a unique uh, thing happening in astronomy, and that is we're, many of us astronomers are realizing we're going to have to develop an intimate relationship with biologists because it's the biologists that tell us, uh, you know, what civilizations produce and how they affect the atmosphere and how, how life life interacts with the atmosphere at various stages in the planet's evolution. So this is going to be an interdisciplinary search. Oh, I think the ultimate interdisciplinary search. Yeah, that, in fact, this, it's a new discipline emerging, and it's so new they haven't even agreed on the name for it yet. It's, some people call it bioastronomy, some people call it astrobiology. So it's, yeah, it's an emerging field of science, really. And there's a thin line we walk between the definitions we use to understand life on Earth and what, what we might have to do to broaden that definition to receive data about life that might not be like life on Earth. And so th 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 that frontier 
is going to force us to stay very open-minded about what might be out there. A couple of questions. i got no, not much time. CD, S-E-T-I, is, is I remember, is this idea of finding out whether somebody's sending out waves that we can pick up. Right. Is that it? Search for, for extraterrestrial intelligence, listening for radio signals from aliens, just like in the movie Contact, right. is, a real, is a real project. It's really still going on, and they are actively listening even as we speak. And so they're hopeful, too. They're hopeful, too. Uh, the possibility, your best instinct, your best guess, that there is life of an intelligent form similar to us somewhere else in some other place. Yeah, I think it's, it's well... Likely? Probably? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm riding the fence on that, because if you look at the history of life on Earth, by most definitions of intelligence, nearly all life that has ever existed on Earth has not been intelligent, mm -hmm. yet it's been getting along just fine. So it doesn't appear that intelligence is a prerequisite to, to survive to, right. and to exist. And so I'm happy just looking for life at all, all right. whether or not it can do complex mathematics. In your fondest, fondest hopes, what do you hope is there? Well, I, I mean, there are, there are millions and millions of stars just like the sun out there. M many of them have planets. Many of them uh, have life. I'm almost certain it is almost impossible to believe that on at least some there isn't life that can communicate with us and can exchange information with us at some point. I believe it's out there. That can communicate with us and exchange some kind of common yeah. ground information. Yes. Friendly information. We Ed, have. where do you come down on this? <laughs> I think uh, finding intelligent life, my, my greatest science fiction would be finding a civilization that had technologies that had na enabled us to travel between the stars. I think that's the biggest stumbling block. So, so we hear a, a civilization 20 light years away, what are we going to do about it? So I you know, look forward 500, 1,000 years to the days we might have the technology to actually go someplace. Especially since the round trip signal takes 40 years, yeah. Yeah. 20 years. <laughs> and maybe they have the technology. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Pleasure. Interesting stuff. The book, again, Other Worlds, A Search for Life in the Universe, Michael Lemonick of Time Magazine. We'll be right back. Stay with us.